Okay, so thank you very much. And now I will give the floor to our director, Stefano Ruffo. I feel uh, really very touched to be here in the room uh, uh, that has been devoted to Boris. And uh, I really wanted to be here in presence. Uh, it's important that Lisa uh, has recognized this uh, amazing and important mathematician with devoting a, a room to him and uh, also uh, creating the prize, uh, to which I remember uh, gave contribution from, uh, we received contribution from uh, Foundation Illy and from uh, uh, Sisama Media Lab. And I hope that the prize will be sponsored also uh, significantly in the, in the next years, in the coming years. So I, I would like to add a few words for the brief time I had in contact and interaction with Boris and it was within between 2016 and 2018 when finally he came ill and then he died in 2019. Uh, and uh, the interaction with him was uh, always extremely clear, direct, and transparent, and was really a fantastic person, besides being a, a great scientist, a great mathematician. And uh, I would like to, rem to say uh, something uh, demonstrating his uh, really open-mindedness, that uh, he was, I don't know if it is known, but he was one of the sponsors of uh, the creation of a data science group at CISA. So it was, a, although it was quite far from, uh, from his uh, field of research, he was the one among a few group of, in a, in a small group of people who uh, came to me and uh, gave me advice in uh, creating this group. So I would like to say that uh, if the group exists now, and in fact the group has been created, since 2016, and we have now a small group in data science. Uh, it's also a merit of, uh, of uh, Boris. Uh, this is maybe not, not known, but he, he really pushed very much in favor of this uh, the creation of this group. So, and the other thing I, I would like to say is, uh, really touching to see the picture where uh, I'm, I'm also present. That was in the country side near Verona, I think, or, or Vicenza. And I remember very well uh, that meeting. It was extremely interdisciplinary meeting uh, with uh, theoretical physicists and mathematicians and, and even experimental physicists. And so and that was very, really amazing that Boris was able to really interact with uh, people with uh, so many different uh, cultures. And uh, finally, I, I would like to take the opportunity to say hello to Irina, and uh, I hope that uh, I will meet you, Irina, again. And uh, so stay well and uh, in good health. Bye-bye. Uh, Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much, Stefano. Now I wish to welcome the medal winners, Gaetan Borot and Alexander Bruyak, and uh, Marta Mazzocco will do the laudatio of the work of uh, Gaetan. Marta? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm sorry because it was very touching, the video. And uh, I thought of starting by reminding everybody how Dubrovin was a really um, gi a giant who, who deeply influenced our lives and careers. And uh, um, one of the themes of his research was the interplay between geometry, analysis, and physics. And uh, uh, Gaetan's research has been also firmly grounded in the same field. Um, Gaetan started as a PhD student of Bertrand Neynard in Sakli, and uh, he set out to work on topological recursion. And I'm sorry. Um, I would like to stress 
I don't need to explain to the to this audience what is topological recursion, but I would like to stress that the spirit of topological recursion is in fact very much related to the spirit of Dubrovin and Jung theory on normal forms of bi-Hamiltonian speedies. And I expect that the interchange between ideas of these two areas will be in fact very fruitful in years to come. So in his PhD, Gaetan uh, worked on a mix of geometry and combinatorics, including a proof of the conjecture by Bouchard and Marigno, a series of important works on the ON model and rectifying the conjecture of Degraff, Fuji, and Manabe. Uh, this led to the first reference that I have here, which is a monograph with Kionet and Koslowski. He then moved on to postdoctoral work and there he broadened his research horizon amazingly. And uh, I am only quoting here four papers Gaetan has produced more than 30 papers and they are a pleasure to read. These four I've chosen because they are kind of a taste of what he's done and what he keeps doing. So um, the second reference is a work with Einar and Orantan on eigenvalues models with asymptotically Coulomb interaction at short distance. In the third, um, work was in collaboration with Shadrin, and uh, it's a very cast of topological recursion in the so called blob formalism. More recently, um, he has done a lot of work on the so called quantum Eddy structures, which were introduced by Soiberman and Konsevich. Um, and uh, this is really quite amazing work. Uh, Gaetan has given several lectures on this on the topological recursion seminar that we organize on Tuesday. They have been recorded and I sincerely um, recommend all the audience to, to try and listen to them if you haven't yet, because they were really beautiful. And the last paper I've selected was this work in, pro in um, collaboration with Anderson and Orantan, which is I guess, the subject of his talk today, which is an idea to reinterpret topological recursion as a recursive construction of mapping class group invariance for function on the Teichmiller space. So as I said, Gaetan has been hugely prolific. His research interests include combinatorics, probability, modulis of curves, integrable systems, conformal field theory, topological string theory, no dimensional topology, and is certainly very, um, he certainly embodies the spirit of, of this medal. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Marta. So now, Gaetan, the floor is yours. So I wish to thank uh, our first winner, Gaetan Boro. So let me introduce. Okay, so I wish to welcome our first winner, Gaetan Boro, who is going to speak about the uh, integrable system in the memory of uh, yes, we, okay, geometry and topological recursion. Thank you very much. Gaetan, you are muted. Gaetan? Yes. Okay, so the, I leave you the floor. Thank you. So um, I want to start by I mean, first thanking Marta and also Tamara for the nice video, Marta for the Rodazio. And I want to start by recalling that uh, how I met Boris and with Boris and Tamara, uh, because I did an internship during my PhD uh, in Trieste. It was exactly the time where CISA was moving from the sea to Opicina. And um, I have very fond memories of um, this time, um, discussing with Boris and Tamara. And that's also how I discovered that in fact, Frobenius manifolds, and I got more into integrability. 
<clears throat> so today, um, I will try to start with uh, first a little history um, of topological recursion, something very short to remind what we knew at the time of my PhD, uh, which may seem were pioneered by Enar, Orantin, also Chekhov, uh, which ideas started to emerge 15 years ago. And what we, I mean, the progress that has been made since 15 years. So the context of this talk is um, to study counting surfaces in many different instances. It can mean actual counting, triangulations, quadrangulations of remnants of uh, some surface of genus G. It could mean Gromov-Witten invariants. Um, it could mean counting branch covers. This is Hurwitz's theory. And in all the situations, um, you put the numbers which count, which solve your problem into generating series, um, FGNs. And sometimes, like in gromov witten theory, actually this coming much, it has more refined information. Uh, it defines for you cohomology classes on the modularized space of curves, or sometimes even better functions on the modularized space of curves which you want to integrate to find your numerical invariant. And all of those are realizations in different contexts of ideas coming from quantum field theory, where one wants to sum over all surfaces. So one thing which is a very simple idea one can try to implement is the idea of cut and paste. Surfaces are classified by the genus and number of boundaries. Um, and their complexity is measured by the order characteristic, 2g minus 2 plus n up to a sign. And if you cut your surface into pieces, you're going to lower this number 2g minus 2 plus n. And so you can think, can one solve a given problem in a recursive way on the topology? Because of mirror symmetry, this also has relations to um, the complex geometry of algebraic varieties. And it turns out this generating series, I mean, a baby a statement of mirror symmetry would, would be to say that you can obtain these generating series or their coefficients um, as periods on some algebraic varieties, which are mirror to your original problem. So what we want to do is to somehow understand algebraic structure which are common to all of this problem and understand why they appear. So the origin of all of this actually dates back from the 90s. It was in the study of large size expansion in Hermitian matrix models. So here M is a, is a Hermitian matrix of size N. V is, let's say, a polynomial. And you want to compute the correlation function. Uh, so this expected value of traces of resolvents with respect to this measure. And if you're lucky, or if you do it formally, this is going to have a large N Asymptotic expansion, so in one over m. And what Chekhov and Arantin found more than 50 years ago was that you can compute this FGN recursively. That was known from the 90s. But the result takes a beautiful form, which is universal and only involves a certain period computation on the spectral curve of the model. And they called this formalism topological recursion because there's a recursion on 2g minus 2 plus n, which is reminding you of all the characteristic. So here is a structure of such a recursion. I will try not to go too much in detail. But you obtain the FGNs as a sum of finitely many terms, which are in correspondence with way to embed a pair of pent into a surface of genus G with n boundaries, starting from the first boundary. Um, and so that when you remove this surface, you still obtain something which is positive or a characteristic, a negative or a characteristic. And these pictures, you want to consider them up to diffeomorphism. And this is why there's only finitely many. The terms that you see uh, are only depending on the topology of what remains when I remove the yellow part. So 15, 10 years ago, there's been several results that were pointing that this structure is actually much more interesting than just the realm of the matrix of matrix models. First, there was a proof by Mirzakhani of a recursion for the Valley-Peterson volumes of the modularized space of border dream and surfaces. 
And Enor and Orantin have shown this is equivalent to topological recursion on this spectral curve. And there's no matrix model for that. You can also reformulate the Witten's conjecture, which is the Vera Soro constraints for the Psychas integrals over the modulated space of curves, which have been proved by Konsevich for the KDV part and by Dagra Falinda Falinda, uh, who showed that the Vera Soro is equivalent to the KDV equations. So all of that is a theorem since the early 90s. And this is equivalent to topological recursion on this very simple spectral curve, x equal y squared over two. So based on this, in fact, this topological recursion had many properties in common to what was expected to be the B model of topological strings. And that prompted Bouchard, Clem, Marino, and Pasquetti to propose a general conjecture that if you take a Calabio threefold, um, it has a certain mirror by mirror symmetry, um, which uh, in that case, uh, there is a curve inside this mirror. Um, and if you apply topological correction to that curve, which is called the mirror curve, you will find the old general open group of Witten theory. And it was supported by numerical experiments. Out of this, in fact, topological strings in a certain limit is going to degenerate to Hurwitz theory, which is counting branch covers. So your invariance, the group of Witten invariance in a certain limit are actually counting simple branch covers of the Riemann sphere. And so as a consequence, Boucher and Mario derived this conjecture that topological recursion, recursion on this curve computes simple Hurwitz numbers. And um, two years after, Nobre and Scott came up that actually uh, this application curve to Gromovitin theory is not bound to just Tarek Calabio threefolds. Uh, you can also do that for a certain, for um, for example, Fano, like P1, and it's topological recursion on this curve. So you see, there were some results and some conjectures. And how could one actually prove at that time that topological recursion appears and why does it appear? There were essentially two methods. The first one via, was by analysis of Schwinger Dyson equations in the context of matrix models. And that was leading to a proof, for example, of three, I mean, building on what Konsevich had done, and to some attempts to prove um, the bouchard marignot conjecture and or more generally the remodeling the B model conjecture. And so it is this attempt which Marta quoted in the Laudatio, which turned out, in fact, not to be um, rigorous for a certain uh, question of convergence. But then the proof was found by Menar, Mulas, and Safnuk by analysis of other functional equations in Herbert's theory, which are called cut and join equations, which is bring branch points together, see how your cover degenerates. And that led to the question well, maybe this relation to topological recursion is much more general. Uh, maybe one can apply that to other types of Herbert's numbers. But at that time, we knew nothing. It was only the simple Hurwitz number example, which was known and on the verge of being proved. And then there was this isolated example by the uh, great work of Mirza Hani, who showed uh, actually a recursive partition of unity on the Teichmüller space, which I'm going to explain. And she showed how to obtain, she proved that geometrically. And she showed that integrating that over the moduli space gave a recursion which is the same as topological recursion for the volumes. So around the same time, there were some hints that there should be a relation with um, uh, what Boris de Robin had developed. So the theory of probabilistic manifolds and some uh, works of Givental. Uh, so the Givental formalism and Gram of Witten theory that maybe would give a clue why this remodeling B model conjecture could hold. But at that time, it was quite fuzzy. So nowadays, we understood many more things. Also, there are some open problems, and I will mention some open problems during my talk. So first, this analysis of schwinger dyson equation that has been systematized to a very large class of matrix model. That's in one of the paper that Marta mentioned with NR and Oranta. Besides, 
Also at the beginning, there were some issues about do this asymptotic expansion matrix model exist? That also has been um, proved rigorously. And part of the work is from Alvevario, Paso, and Chabina from the years 2000. And this was systematized to include much more general matrix model with Guyon and Koslovsky. So on Hervit's side, um, somehow with the recent work of Shadrin um, of this year uh, and collaborators, and which was fueled by a lot of work by the school of Shadrin in Amsterdam, the school of Kazarian in Moscow, and many other people. Um, we have a very good understanding of topological recursion for Herbert's theory. Um, and that was done so partly by analysis of cut and drawn equations or by analysis of formulas coming from integrability. There is by now another a theory of reconstruction of WKB expansions of um, ODEs, at least formal WKB expansions, which is still on being developed. And there's a lot of results already available. We have geometric methods, and that's I'm going to talk more about it. The really expected relation to Fabian's manifold given tal formalism and cumulative field theories has been established, mainly in the work of Dunin, Barkovsky, Orantin, Spitz, and Shadrin. And there are some quite general relation to intersection theory on the modularized space of curves, which at the time we only had this little example of MGF, the fundamental class of MGN bar. And finally, there's a new uh, perspective, which has some prehistory in the work of Orantin and Kostov, but now led to many new results, which is based on CFT, so more concretely, the representation theory of vertex operator algebras. And I'm also going to talk about that. So a lot of results could be obtained by these various different methods, uh, including a proof of the, of the remodeling B model conjecture by Enar and Orantin, and another one by Liu and Melissa Liu and her collaborators. But my purpose for today is much uh, more limited. I would like to explain, so what to understand, so what is the geometric origin and what is the algebraic origin for topological recursion in a way that gives access to proofs of results. So we start by recalling the work of Miyazahani in 2007. We start with a compact oriented smooth surface, genus G with N boundaries. And we can consider the Teichmuller space, which has many descriptions, but one of them is the space of hyperbolic metrics on your surface with geodesic boundaries up to local change of coordinates. When you mod out by all diffeomorphism, therefore by the mapping class group, you find the modulized space of border dream on surfaces. And this has a symplectic form, which is well known, is due to Weil Peterson. And uh, this modulized space has a finite volume. In order to compute this uh, with the idea to use this idea of cut and paste, we need to introduce the following set, P sigma which is this set of isotopy class of embeddings of pairs of pens with labeled boundaries, starting from the first boundary of the surface. So here, this is the one. And so that when you remove it, you get still a surface with negative order characteristic. We've already seen these pictures before in topological recursion, but here I want to stress this is doing, this is done up to isotopies, not up to diffeomorphisms. If you do a den twist, you get a different picture. Therefore, this set is infinite. And here's the result of Miyazahani. The details of the formula are not important. What is important is that the constant function one on Teichmuller space can be written as a series over this set of um, isotopy class of pairs of pens of certain explicit functions, which only depend on the three boundary lengths of the pair of pens. And integrating that, she has found the topological recursion where now all the terms are in bijection not with this isotopic class of pairs of pens, but rather diffeomorphism class of pairs of pens. It's an effective recursion to compute these volumes. The idea of her proof is uh, very interesting and inspiring. Take a hyperbolic bordered surface and start, pick a point on the first boundary. 
shoot from their geodesic orthogonally and see what happens. Um, maybe the geodesic will intersect itself, then you stop. Or it's going to hit the boundary, then you stop. Or it's going to spiral, maybe around the boundary. Or it's going to spiral and accumulate along a certain curve in the surface. Except in this last case, you can attach an isotopic class of pair of pens, uh, where this, which is characterized by this geodesic. These are drawn in yellow here. And the last case is actually very rare. It only happens for a set of measure zero of initial points. So you can write that the length of this boundary is the sum of the length of the parts of the boundary where you hit exactly a given pair of pads, summing over all possible pairs of pads. With a bit of hyperbolic trigonometry, the length of these parts leading to a given pair of pens can be computed. And this gives rise to the function b and c, which I had written here. So you obtain this result. Or she obtained this result. This idea inspired us with Anderson and Orantin to give a general geometric framework. Um, so as Marta said, you produce mapping class group invariance using ideas of cut and paste. But instead of presenting you this general framework, I'm going to say a very specific example uh, to produce functions on Teichmann space, which are mapping class group invariance. That means function on the moduli space, which therefore you can integrate. So you pick some initial data, A, B, C attached to pairs of pens, and D attached to a torus with one boundary. So functions on this corresponding Teichmann space. And you, you want to construct some function omega sigma, which is a function on the Teichmann space of sigma for any surface of any topology. If you're are on the base topology, you just take it from initial data, A and D. If the surface is disconnected, you just take the product of the two, because Teichmann space is a Cartesian product. And in the general case, you obtain omega sigma as a sum of all ways of excising a pair of pens. So from this set P sigma we've seen, and then you put the function B and C, which are part of initial data times Omega of sigma minus p, so that's the surface. You remove that pair of pent along a geodesic representative that always exists in this isotopy class. And therefore, if you have a point in the Teichmuller space, you get a hyperbolic metric that you can restrict on sigma minus p. And so by induction, you already know a function on Teichmuller space of sigma minus p, which you use here. Of course, these sums are infinite, it's a series. So it can only converge if um, B and C satisfy some bounds. And so the purpose of our work, if that's the non-trivial part of it, is to find a formalism and some set of axioms for which this is actually well-defined, meaning that these series converge absolutely on any compact of the Teichmuller space. If this is true, the mapping class group just permutes term in the sum, it permutes isotopic class of pairs of pens. Therefore, the result is going to be mapping class group invariant. And since it's mapping class group invariant, you can integrate it descends to the moduli space and you can integrate, integrate it there against a natural measure like the Val Peterson measure. And the integration lemma of Mirzakhani can be adapted and give directly this topological recursion for these integrals. A key in this proof is the fact that Fenchel Nielsen coordinates are canonical coordinates for the Val Peterson symplectic form, which is a fact due to Volpert in the 80s. And that is compatible with cutting and gluing. So not only the omega sigma has some relation when you cut, but also the measure on which you integrate. So this theory uh, wants to see topological recursion as a shadow after integration of a moduli of finer recursions at the geometric level. So here's the first application. 
um, take the space of the set of all primitive multi curves. So these is unions of simple closed curves, which are not pairwise homotopic, neither homotopic to the boundaries. So here in orange, I draw a multi curve with two components. And take a test function. And what you want to do is to look at the statistics when you sum over multi curves, f the test function applied to the length of the of any of the component of the multi curve. So it's probing the simple length spectrum of the hyperbolic surface. And we prove with Anderson and Orantin that this is that this is obtained by geometric recursion for a twisting of Mirzahani initial data. So this A, M, B, M, C, M, they are the function of Mirzahani, but now you add some pieces in it. And the idea of the proof is beautiful. You take this function and secretly in front of this product here, you have a constant function one. Therefore, you can use Mirzahani identity to write it as a sum over pairs of pens in sigma minus the multi curve. These sums are absolutely convergent if F decays fast enough, so you can exchange. And then you get the sum of all pairs of pens and sum of all multi curves that don't cross this pair of pens. Of course, some components of this multi curve could be common with one of the boundary of your pair of pens. And so you have to discuss cases. That's what I draw, all the pictures I drew here. But when you collect everything, you recognize putting apart these components which are common with the boundary of the pair of pent. You recognize it takes the form of the geometric recursion here, but with new functions b and c, which are given by here. And these terms exactly correspond to these pictures. Therefore, since you have geometric recursion, you can you obtain that the Weil Peterson average of these statistics satisfy topological recursion. And you can draw various consequences from this. One of them was a computation of major Vich volumes of quadratic differential uh, in a joint work with um, so Anderson, Charbonnier, Delcroix, Jacquetto, Levansky, and Wheeler. So that, in fact, um, can also be done not in different contexts. One of them is the context of combinatorial Teichmuller space. It's another model for the Teichmuller space, which is defined as a space of isotopic class of metric ribbon graphs, such that the surface retracts on the graph. So on the right is an example in red. This is homomorphic to the Teichmuller space, but it carries a different geometry. For example, it's not a smooth manifold, it's rather a polytopal complex. And there's a symplectic form, at least almost everywhere, which was defined by Konsevich, and which is mapping class group invariant. So it's omega k here. There's an associated volume form, mu k. And what Konsevich has proved with some caveats that Zvonkin had fixed later is that if you want the psychas integrals over the moduli space of curves, it's exactly the symplectic volume of this combinatorial moduli space. And from this, he related the left hand side with matrix models and could prove Witten's conjecture. But now we can do something much more geometric. The first I need one ingredient, which is an analog of fenchel nissen coordinates in this combinatorial setting. This exists, and it's closely related to what's called dense certain coordinates for measured foliations. There's, however, a difference is that the image of this map of these coordinates is not full. You miss a zero measure set. And then you know that the conservative symplectic form should be an omega k is actually a canonical in these coordinates. So you have an analog of Volpert result. And so what's missing to run the program is, is an analog of Miyazahani identity. 
Because then if I integrate it, um, because I have this dl d tau formula and function Nielsen coordinates this combinatorial one as the hyperbolic one, they're compatible with cutting and gluing, you're going to be able to integrate that to a topological recursion. And the answer is yes, there is one, which was only discovered uh, recently, um, but it's much simpler to prove. And the way it is proved is that you also want to shoot geodesics. But in the combinatorial Teichmuller space, it's as if metrically your surface was just squeezed to the graph. So well, as soon as you shoot, you already arrived. You just write that the length of the first boundary is the length of the edges of the ribbon graph that you meet around this boundary. And that also determined, according to this picture, a isotopic class of pair of pens. And you can compute the length in term, the length of this edge in terms of the length of the boundaries of the pair of pent, and that gives you the combinatorial measure of any max chain identity. So there's several things that you may hope for the future from, from this. First, there was also written R spin conjecture, which concerns an analog of a fundamental class for the modularized space of R spin structures. Therefore, Riemann surfaces with punctures together with a line bundle whose Rth power is fixed. It's a twisted canonical. The construction of this class has been very hard, uses advanced technical algebraic geometry. And there's only one proof, contrary to the Witten's conjecture, of this Witten R spin conjecture, which is due to Faber, Shadwin, and Zvonkin. And Milanov proved that actually you have topological recursion for intersection of this class with psi classes. So it's quite frustrating that we don't have a different geometric approach, a la Mirzakhani, as I presented for the Witten R spin. For that reason, it remains a very mysterious object. The second thing which one can hope for, and this is a work in progress with Anderson and Orantin, is to do the same thing as geometric recursion, but for, for surfaces with boundaries and corners. Uh, we in fact have already an open Miyazahani identity. You also can do twisting, therefore you get access to statistics of the length spectrum, but now because you allow corners, you allow curves which can intersect each other. So you look at all closed curves. And since we have Selbeck trace formula, this gives you access to, uh, to statistics of the Laplace spectrum from geometric recursion. And then you can think we're not there yet if one can integrate that over the open moduli space. So that's um, a direction which I think has a lot to bring for the future. How much time is remaining, uh, Tamara? I can't hear you. You're mute. So we have uh, still uh, uh, 15 minutes, yeah. OK. Thanks. So I have explained geometrically what the origin of topological recursion. And now I want to explain from a totally different perspective, algebraically, how topological recursion also naturally arise. And as I say, there was some relation between topological recursion and CFTs, because topological recursion solved via several constraints that had been pointed out in 2010 by Kostov and Orantin. But everything became um, much more general and um, could actually bring things forward when Konsevich and Zobelman invented area structures. So to say what is an area structure, um, take a vector space and consider the, consider the algebra of differential operators on this vector space, maybe involving a formal parameter h bar. An area structure is a collection of differential operators uh, on this vector space, which have two properties. The first one is that for each of the direction in your vector space, you have 
one operator which starts with h bar zero dxi plus something of higher order. So if you just if you didn't have this thing of higher order, just h bar zero dxi, that would just be the standard the trivial connection um, here. So the solution would just be trivial. But here you allow higher order terms, but you want these things to be compatible with each other. So when you commute two of these operators, it should be in the left ideal generated by the operators that you have. And these two properties guarantee that's a theorem in general by conservation solvent man. But if you have a quantum array structure, there exists a unique formal function, so which has an expansion of this form. Um, and the coefficient Taylor coefficients uh, are called MGNs, which is killed by all the operators in the area structure after you take the exponential. So it's a collection of linear ODE over H bar. And the reason why we care about this <coughs> is that in fact, almost all of what I told today, all the problems at the beginning can be formulated in this way. So the topological recursion, for example, this structure with removing pairs of pens up to diffeomorphisms. If you just look at the case where your area structure operators have degree two maximum, so you can have xx, h bar divided dx, h bar squared dx dx, plus a constant times h bar. So h bar has positive degree two uh, in this context. Then the FGNs in this theorem are exactly computed by the topological recursion formula. So that's the discovery of conservation solvent. And the B and the C and the A and the D, they appear as initial data and the weights of these pairs of pens. So this identifies the minimal algebraic conditions for TR to emerge. It's not at all clear that there exists quantum array structures because that condition of compatible enough operators which are compatible with each other, this is guaranteeing existence of a common solution to all these differential equations. That's not at all obvious that exists in a non-trivial way. But if you have one, you have a huge abelian group of symmetries um, acting on every structure. And I'm just going to give one of this element because maybe the most important, it is Bogoliubov transformation where you conjugate your operators by exponential of a purely quadratic differential operator, which means your partition function exponential of F over H bar just gets multiplied from the left values operator, which is the same as a Gaussian convolution. On the ABCD, these coefficients of the area structure, you can write down what this conjugation is doing. And this has the same structure of the twisting I had presented before. So the twisting, which is doing a statistical multi-curves is exactly the geometric lift of these symmetries of area structures. And on the side of uh, the partition function of the F, it transform F, it makes it become a sum of stable graphs where the old Fs are the weights of the vertices and the U by which you twist is the weight of the edges. So how to find quantum array structures? Um, there is a um, general strategy, which find its roots in the work of Milanov in 2016, um, uh, and then which was somehow systematized and made in much broader context in um, a joint work with Bouchard Shidambaram Kotsishin Noshenko uh, about three years ago. And the point is that if you have a vertex operator algebra, that means a 2D chiral CFT, you have the freedom to choose a twisting if your algebra has automorphisms. And if you have a free field representation of this, then you can construct, or at least there's a strategy to try to construct quantum array structures. Whether you succeed or not, it's a matter of computation. The fundamental example of this is for W, the W algebras. So WSL2, this is the Vera Soro CFT. 
And the WGLR is a generalization which was uh, initiated by Zamorochikov in the 80s. So here you have generators, which are called the modes, indexed by an integer and some element between one and R. And there's a question of central charge, which is a parameter. Um, and you have more automorphism when the central charge is uh, it's called self dual sequel R. But this thing is well known from the 80s that it admits free field representation. That means the representations by differential operators. And this tricky condition, which is this compatibility of differential operators, that's why we use the VOA structure. So using representation theory of VOAs, you can identify a subset of the modes so that in the representation that satisfy these commutation relations. So you get an ideal of modes. For example, you could take positive modes on a positive case, but there are many others. And now by a trick, there's a more and more step you have to do. You have to allow translation of your variables. So not expand around zero in your vector space, but expand around another point. And there's a tension between which translation you can do and which ideal you can get. You can choose in order to, to satisfy the two conditions of an error structure, the degree one condition and the compatibility condition. So here's uh, the result that if you choose this very special central charge equal R and you twist by the full cycle um, or the full permutation, then if you take an S such that R is plus or minus one modulo S and S is between one and R plus one. And if you just take that subset of modes, um, so it's going to be less than just the positive modes, then you obtain an area structure with this very specific translation. And therefore a certain partition function, FGN that depends on this R and S, which is computed by TR. And of course, the natural question is what does it compute? Since we worked hard to get it to construct that, what is it useful for? You can also do the same where you don't take the full cycle, but you get a fixed point. In that case, you need S, div uh, S that divides R and you get some F tilde. If you want to allow many more, many twists by arbitrary permutations, there's a sort of classification that you can get, which was studied by with, in the work with Kramer and Schuller. So the relation with the old version of topological regression in terms of geometry of spectral curves and period computation is that if you have any spectral curve, or rather it works in this way, if you have a, a area structure coming from a VOA in this way, there is a corresponding spectral curve on which you have TR, and then your omega G and your differentials on the spectral curve, which you compute by periods on the spectral curve encode the Taylor coefficient of this partition function. So there's a correspondence between W constraints, you could say, and spectral curves. And the great thing about this theory of every structure is that it proves that the FGNs are well-defined. That means they're symmetric, which is one thing which is not at all obvious in the in our Orantin Chekhov topological recursion. And also when you see these, these formulas in terms of pairs of pens, we always excise from the first boundary. So this is special. So in order for that to be well-defined, you need to prove symmetry. And it only it was known for spectral curve with simple ramification points before. But this theorem tells you that it's well-defined as well. Whenever the local behavior of spectral curve is such that the S and R satisfy this congruence. So it proves well definition of the B model for a larger class of one dimensional Landau-Gisbrook models. But it also gives obstructions because when S and R don't satisfy these conditions, you can actually prove that the natural formula you would write doesn't give symmetric FGNs. And the case of other twists uh, actually correspond to certain singular curves, kind of non-reducible, for example. So what does it mean in terms of Frobenius structures? It means that in, for spectral curves of this type and only this type, 
one expects that their the, the deformation space should carry a Frobenu structure. But it's only known for simple ramification points so far. And it would be very interesting to understand what is special about this text. It just means that the Dubrovin theory of primary differential, so you get the prepotential, is not going to define, I mean, you define it by integrating something uh, close to form. So there's something which a tensor which is symmetric. And here the naive formula doesn't give something symmetric, so you cannot do it that way. So it's an interesting question what happens for these other curves. Good. So I insist about twisting, but what about if you don't twist, what happens? And this is something that um, we found in the recent work with Bouchard, Shidambaram, Kreutzich. Um, it describes supersymmetric gauge theories. But for that, we have to rely on something which was already done in math and in physics. So this MGD is a moduli space of anti self dual SUR instantons of the four sphere with instanton number D. And by classical work of the nuts, and you can reduce that to a problem in algebraic geometry, which is studying algebraic bundles with fixed second chain class. And when you study super n equal to supersymmetric gauge theory uh, with equivalent parameters, um, so there's a C star square and the Carton torus of the SLR, which is acting, the partition for the physical partition function, in whatever way you approach it, should reduce to integrals over the moduli space of curve using supersymmetric localization. So you have a certain Nekrasov partition function which count instantons, which is this partition function, depending on epsilon one, epsilon two, and the equivalent parameters. So mathematically, one way to construct it is to partially compactify this moduli space of instantons and look at a certain cohomology theory. So there are several variants here. What I will talk about really concerns an intersection cohomology for a certain stratification. Then you put all of that together I mean, for all instanton numbers. And there's a certain fundamental class of this moduli space, which is called a Gaioto vector. And then for an intersection pairing, the Nekrasov partition function is the norm of this Gaioto vector. And that's what you want to compute. So 10 years ago, there's been conjectures of Aldai, Gaoto, and Tachikawa, which relates this Nekrasov partition function to WSLR conformal blocks. And the story is much more general. It's not just bound to SLR, but you know, we just restrict to this. And in fact, replace the SLR by GLR because it's a bit simpler. And as a mathematical result, which incarnate this, which is due to Schiffman and Vasro for SLR, and Breverman, Finkelman, Nakajima for more general, um, simply laced and simple the algebras. It consists of three parts. It says that this cohomology is a Verman module for WGLR with a central charge that depends on the parameters. And the Gaioto vector, which you want to compute, is a Whittaker vector. So it's not annihilated by all positive modes but it's rather an eigenvector. And the coupling constant of the theory lambda appears here as an eigenvalue and is just for the one mode, otherwise it's killed by all the other modes. Moreover, the intersection pairing which you need to compute the Nekrasov partition function is explicitly described in terms of the W algebra. So in summary, these things can be represented by differential operators using free field representation. And what we proved is that indeed, if you put this lambda on the other side, because you want something that kills one, this is a quantum array structure. So it's WGLR non-twisted and its partition function is exactly your Gaioto vector and therefore it's computed by top of recursion. I told you there's a spectral curve description. So you can obtain that in terms of period on a certain curve. And if you, give this, if you do epsilon one plus epsilon two equals zero, that's a special central charge. It's an unramified curve. If you want to do the refined case, which is general equivalent parameters, it's rather a non commutative curve. It's a regular D module on P1. So you get to get T, another version of TR, which is non commutative, 
which means you compute periods of solution of these differential equations. Good. So I guess I'm close to the end. Is it correct? Yes. Yes. So yeah. Time is. I'm going to go directly to to the end, um, which is formulating an open problem, uh, which mixes different parts, uh, which are very commonly seen in some examples of this uh, innovative geometry. Um, so more generally, the Witten R spin, for which there is a topological recursion, um, it's part of a more general theory of equivalent Landau-Ginsburg potentials. And for that, there's fan Jarvis written we and class run written classes. And you may want to compute their intersection numbers against psi classes. There are some links understood, at least for the ADE case, ADE singularities, two integrable hierarchies of the infant circle of type. And I would like to say that to this one should be able to attach a VOA with a quantum array structure such that this is computing the partition function for this fan Javis written um, classes. But nothing like that is known to my knowledge. That would enlarge the, our understanding of a set of building blocks for topological field theories. And also I skip that. I want to say that for many of these area structure which I mentioned, we understand some links to intersection theory, which are either proved or conjectural. So the proved one are green, conjectural are in orange. And um, I will also covers open R spin theory. There's this F tilde, which I showed. And this has had a lot of use in Herbert's theory, for example, to get the LSD formula from topological recursion. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, so thank you very much, Gertan, for the excellent talk and presentation of your research. So, may, any questions or comments for from the audience now? I have one. Yes, please, Guillaume. Uh, reality is true, but it's quick. I, I'd like to know if there is some uh, interpretation of Gromov with and of PN in terms of uh, uh, topological recursion and uh, how difficult in practice to do topological recursion when the spectral curve has genus at least one? So for your first question, the answer, I mean, it's Nicolas Rantin has studied that for years. Um, the answer is that in principle, it is possible using um, Dubrovin superpotential. In practice, the computation are pretty complicated Somehow you need a theory of topological recursion for not spectral curve, but varieties it's for a general landau ginsburg model. And Nicolas Rantin had some attempts to, uh, to write that down. I think he has some draft notes, but nothing released. Um, so conceptually that probably exists uh, for computations so far, it seemed quite cumbersome. As regards your second question, um, so when the curve is genus one, you can still uniformize it by a complex variable with elliptic functions. Um, therefore, you can work quite well with that. If your curve is hyper elliptic, you can still um, work, I mean, with, I mean, after all, meromorphic forms are just rational function of X and Y, modulo the polynomial equation of your curve. And, and that you can work with. Um, it's quite doable for hyperelliptic curves. You can also do something for non hyperelliptic curves, but I think very few people have carried that out in a concrete example. Um, however, the higher genus curves, uh, they do appear. Um, for example, in Gram of Witten theory, mirror curves of Torre Calabria threefold have positive genus um, because this correspond to the non-trivial cycles of your Tory graph. And also there's um, some conjectural relation uh, that Marta mentioned, uh, this diagraph Fuji conjecture that we, that we fixed uh, by including some corrections, 
where you take the SL2C character variety of a hyperbolic knot. And topological recursion gives you access to the all order formal expansion of the color John's polynomial, if I want to be a bit sloppy in the statement. Uh, this is more or less that. And these hyperbolic, these um, SL2C character variety for hyperbolic knots, the tables of them, um, they're always of positive genus. Um, it is not proved that uh, if you have a hyperbolic knot, it's always of positive genus, but I suspect it is true. So one needed to test this conjecture to need compute with some concrete example of genus one of genus two. Okay, thank you very much. So any further questions or remarks? Yeah, so, sorry. Uh, yeah, it's a quick question. Maybe um, I'm not sure I understood entirely the context of the previous one, but um, may, it may be related or not. So most of the example that you mentioned in the, in the talk, if not all the examples, the, the base curve when you start the topological recursion is of genus zero. Um, and of course you can do topological recursion also per se on, on a curve of higher genus, but is, is there a setting in which uh, a higher genus uh, cur um, spectral curve for a topological recursion as a clear interpretation in terms of enumerative geometry? So first, because a topological recursion is a local computation, you take residue as ramification points. Um, in fact, you can restrict to local curve, we just have a collection of disks. And so your base is just um, C. So what I presented is uh, not lacking generality compared to topological recursion on curves of higher genus. Um, it's just that you connect these formal neighborhoods together in a global geometry. Um, and then the higher genus examples were actually the geometry, I mean, you gain something when you have this global geometry. You can gain some integrability, for example, or you can deform contours. Uh, you can use then, I mean, when you work on a Hubbard space, you have the canonical coordinates, which are near the branch points. And this is more or less what is used here with the local curves. But to go to Gromov to express Gromov in theory, you need to express your thing in terms of flat coordinates, which are rather expansions at infinity. And for that, you need a global geometry. So that's exactly what you need in Gromov Witten to prove this remodeling the B model conjecture is to work with the global geometry of this curve. And uh, that's higher genus. Okay, thank you. Okay. So Further questions or comments? Probably we are running out of time. There is time for a, for a very fast question. Quick. Okay, so if not, uh, let's, let's thank Gaetan for his wonderful presentation. And I wish since this is the ceremony for awarding the Dubrovin medal, maybe you can show us the medal. <laughs> but you already received nice. my post. Okay. So the picture and uh, congratulations to Gaetan. My best congratulations to Gaetan for being but, um, one of the first recipe of the Dubrovin medal. Thank you. The eyes, the eyes are very lively. So it's a very nice bow Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so maybe we take. Uh, now two minutes uh, technical break because I mean there are a lot of people, two minutes. And uh, then uh, we will have the presentation of uh, Alexander Buriak. Is Alexander already co-host here? Yes, Alexander is already co-host, as I can see. Let's see, Alexander Buriati is co-host, and Paolo Rossi is... Uh, Paolo, are you around? I am here. Okay. Okay, I will use you. So 
we start again at 13. Maybe I, I want to say that uh, there are several break rooms. Uh, so during the breaks, uh, you're also, if you want to talk privately to the speakers uh, or people, there are many break rooms where you can go. Okay, so let's resume. So our next, the next winner is uh, of the Dubrovin medal is Alexander Buriak, and uh, Professor Paolo Rossi will go in, is going to introduce his work. Well, okay, thank you, Tamara. So okay, let me just share some image as a placeholder, and that's it. So I hope you can see it, but so I just took it from CISA's website. Um, so. Um, yeah, it's in fact it's it's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Sasha Sasha uh, Buriak's seminar in acceptance of the Dubrovin Medal. Uh, in particular, I want to say that um, to me uh, it's really appropriate that uh, uh, one of the winners uh, uh, of the first edition of this prize is Sasha for at least two reasons. First, because Sasha kind of incarnates the synthesis of two main mathematical schools. On the relations on relation between integrability and intersection theory in, in the modular spaces of stable curves, a la Witt and Concierge, let's say, not uh, in the sense of spectral curves. Uh, these two schools would be uh, uh, Shadrin's group in Amsterdam, and of course, uh, Baris group in Trieste, with the important branch in Beijing under Eugene Zhang, of course. Um, so, uh, the second reason is that uh, I know for a fact, because I, I kind of had a conversation with Baris about this, that uh, he had an extremely high opinion of Sasha Baris. Uh, in fact, uh, despite, despite his young age, he's considered, uh, so Baris considers Sasha one uh, of the most prominent researchers uh, in the field, uh, in a field that basically coincides with uh, Baris field. Okay. And, um, uh, so Sasha uh, got his master in mathematics in 2009 in Moscow, and then uh, kind of uh, moved to Amsterdam for his uh, PhD. Uh, he kind of got kind of two uh, PhDs, so a double PhD, let's say, uh, one in Amsterdam under Sergei Shadrin, and the other one back in, in Moscow uh, under, I think, under uh, Guzain Zad. And... Uh, uh, then he was a postdoctoral fellow at the DPH under Van der Pande, and uh, he went on to become an academic fellow at the University of Leeds. And uh, finally, now he's, uh, he's been appointed associate professor uh, at the Higher School of Economics in Moscow. Uh, the Dubrovin Medal is not his first important award because he won a Moscow Mathematical Society Award for Young Mathematicians back in 2014. And uh, the Whitehead Prize, a very important prize of the London Mathematical Society in 2019. So, indeed, as many of, of you know, one of the first results that Sasha got was uh, contained already in his PhD thesis, and it's very much related with Barry's work because it was the proof with, uh, with Shadrin and Postuma uh, of the um, polynomiality of the Hamiltonians and Poisson structure for the so called uh, Dubravin Zhang hierarchy. Uh, there's a dispersive deformation of the principal hierarchy of a Dubrovin Frobenius manifold. So it's very deeply connected with the work of Baris. And then, uh, almost immediately after his PhD, uh, Sasha went on initiating the study uh, of the role played by the double ramification cycle in, uh, um, uh, in the relation between uh, uh, integrable systems and modular spaces, basically. Uh, so I was lucky enough to be uh, the referee of that paper. So I in, and also, I was working on symplectic field theory and integrable system, which is a very closely related field. So I immediately recognized 
the importance of that contribution. And I was quick enough to invite him to Dijon. And that started like, a, I think, a 15 paper collaboration that we have uh, ongoing with Sasha on this topic. Um, Sasha's role was not only absolutely prominent in the development of all this story, but also in involving other mathematicians that have joined us through the years. Uh, and this includes Baris himself, uh, with whom we wrote two, pa two papers together with Sasha. And um, finally, uh, I want to mention Sasha's proof of the open version of the witten Konsevich theorem, which is another very important result that he got more recently. Uh, this clarifies the, the role in particular of the, of the wave function of the KDV uh, string solution, basically. Uh, wave function was always kind of lurking in the, back, in the background uh, in this witten Konsevich story. But if you involve Riemann surfaces with boundaries, then uh, the, the wave function plays a prominent role as generating function. So this was a more recent, very important result. So I'm only left with uh, announcing the title of today's talk, which uh, um, we are very uh, eager to uh, listen to. And the title is a non-commutative generalization of the witten konsevich theorem. So thank you very much, Sasha. The stage is yours as soon as I stop sharing. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Paolo, for such nice and uh, warm words. Um, <clears throat> okay, let me share my uh, screen first. Um, yeah, so first of all, I would like to say that I'm very uh, happy to work in uh, <clears throat> uh, this uh, uh, very interesting and fruitful area of integral systems related to curve counting theories, uh, for which Boris Antolich was a uh, driving force for many years. So, and uh, it's a yeah, great honor to receive um, such an award from the Institute uh, where he worked. So thank you very much for that. Uh, yeah, I would also like to say a few words about Boris Antolich. Uh, I uh, met him uh, in the middle of my PhD and um, and uh, when I became a postdoc, we uh, even uh, even I even uh, I was even I had even an opportunity to work work with him a little bit. Uh, so I'm very happy that he um, interested in uh, my uh, alternative approach to integral systems associated to cohomological theories uh, in the DR hierarchies that Paolo mentioned. So I was very happy that he found this interesting and. Uh, also, he was uh, very, despite the fact that he was uh, very busy, he found a time to um, to help us uh, with this project. Uh, so, and um, uh, and yeah, I also actually managed, uh, I will also mention uh, this in my talk. Yeah, and this actually uh, um, uh, moved our uh, project considerably. Um, so we, we even uh, uh, wrote uh, two papers together with Boris Antolovich. Yeah, and uh, second, I was uh, uh, I would like to say that uh, I was uh, always amazed uh, how energetic uh, he was and um, how he loved mathematics. Um, so I um, uh, uh, had a regular had contact uh, with him. Uh, uh, by e email, um, even in the time when he was ill, um, and uh, yeah, uh, uh, and uh, actually, um, yeah, I was amazed uh, that um, yeah. So, for example, um, uh, uh, my my last email, uh, actually our last email that we received, yeah, we uh, Jeremy and Paolo from him. Uh, actually, one week before he passed away, was uh, uh, an exclamation, an Italian. Ex uh, it was an Italian exclamation, uh, approving, um, approving um, uh, the fact that our second paper uh, was accepted in the journal. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I'm now moving to my talk. Uh, so I hope you can uh, see my uh, my uh, my slides. Sorry, uh, Alexander, what, 
Italian? What was Italian expression? Is it is it PG thirteen? Oh, it was very short explanation, so I don't know Italian, so I don't remember oh, exactly. Yeah. So I think Paul Paul. It Paul, was Paul. Evviva, Evviva. Ah, yeah, yeah. Evviva. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, yeah, now I'm, I uh, start my talk. Uh, yeah, I, I already see that my uh, talk will be, uh, the presentation that I have prepared is very much different from uh, Gretan's uh, presentation. So he, um, his uh, talk was very general and uh, covered a lot of uh, topics. Yeah, in contrast, uh, my talk uh, will be focused um, on a yeah, detailed, um, presentation of uh, our recent uh, result, recent joint uh, paper with uh, Paolo Rossi. Um, um, yeah, I see that uh, a wide audience, actually, an audience with, a, with, a, with wide research interests uh, um, attends uh, this audience, uh, this, co this conference. So, um, so, so I even decided to start. Uh, so, and in order to make my talk access, uh, in order to make my talk accessible to such a wide audience, yeah, I even uh, dis dis uh, decided to start from scratch and even to to introduce the modular space of curves uh, very briefly. Uh, yeah, I think it is uh, worth uh, to do it. Yeah, although um, yeah, several speakers uh, bef uh, before me mentioned the modular space of curves, but I don't think that it was introduced. Uh, uh, yeah, in, in details and uh, uh, yeah, since I, th I think that the audience is uh, wide, it is useful. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, so my plan is to uh, yeah, so I will I would like to uh, describe um, a new a new phenom phenomenon that we uh, found together with Paolo. Uh, so we uh, found uh, we observed. Um, that uh, uh, some yeah some structures uh, in the um, geometry of the modular space of curves uh, is uh, is controlled by non-commutative integrable systems. Uh, so yeah, we, we found. Is it just me, or I don't hear Sasha anymore? Is it just me, or can someone uh, else? I can hear. I, I can hear in time. You can hear him ah. well. Mm -hmm. ah, strange. I can hear you too, but not Sasha anymore. Very strange. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Now I can again. It's very strange. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah. So uh, I think uh, that uh, yeah, non-commutative uh, integrable systems um, yeah was not observed in the relation with, with uh, weren't observed in the relation in the relation with um, the geometry of the modular space of curves. So I think this is um, yeah an, inter an interesting phenomenon. That is why I'd like to present. So my plan is to start with Witten's conjecture yeah, to, to introduce intersection numbers on MGN and the KDV hierarchy. Yeah, and then I will move uh, to uh, to the non-commutative uh, to the non-commutative version of the KDV hierarchy and uh, show um, that what kind of intersection numbers it controls. So it occurs that intersection numbers with the double amplification cycles are controlled by a non-commutative KDV hierarchy. Okay, so I, I, I start from a, a very brief um, yeah, description of the modular space of curves. So uh, we have, um, so we have, um, oh, strange. Okay, so we have, um, uh, so we can see the nodal curve, so connected uh, comp compact algebraic curves, uh, uh, such that uh, all its singularities uh, that have the simplest singularities, which are nodes, uh, which locally look like uh, xy equals zero in uh, C2. So these are nodal curves. Uh, yes, and then, uh, so here, yeah, I, um, these are examples of uh, nodal curves. Yeah, and the genius of uh, of uh, a nodal curve is uh, defined in terms of algebraic geometry as the dimension of the first cohomology group of the structure shift, or more geometrically, it is uh, the genius of a smoothing of a curve. So um, we can uh, replace locally uh, such a, an intersection of two lines with uh, 
uh, with a piece of uh, hyperbola. Um, yeah, and this, this defines the smoothing of a curve. And then, yeah, the genius of a curve uh, is uh, equal to the genius of its smoothing. So here, yeah, I draw how it looks. OK, so uh, and then we uh, yeah, would like to consider marked nodal curves, uh, yeah, uh, which are uh, nodal curves with marked points. And uh, they should be pairwise uh, distinct and um, uh, do not coincide with the singular points of our curve. Yes. Um, and then uh, a stable curve is a marked nodal curve uh, such that it's Automorphism group is, um, ah, by the way, it should be like this, I guess. Such that its automorphism group is uh, finite. Uh, yeah, and then uh, the stability uh, condition has a clear combinatorial uh, interpretation. So, uh, stable curve, a uh, node mark nodal curve is stable if and only if uh, 2g minus 2 plus n is greater than zero. And uh, each bubble has uh, at least three special points. So, for example, yeah, in this picture, uh, yeah, I show that yeah, a special point is a marked point and uh, a singular. Uh, so, special points are marked points and singular points. So, yeah, here uh, we see that uh, this bubble, the left, the right bubble, has three uh, special points. Uh, so, this curve is stable. Okay, and then the modular space of curves, MGM, which was mentioned uh, many times in previous talks, is uh, the set of isomorphism classes of stable curves um, of genius G with N mark points. Yeah, and um, uh, usually the isomorphism class of a stable curve is denoted by you know, square brackets. So we add square brackets. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Then, uh, just to mention uh, several uh, properties of the modular space of curves. So, MGN is a complex orbifold, so which locally is a quotient of an open ball in CN by a finite group of dimension three G minus three plus n. Uh, and uh, basic examples uh, that which are uh, good to have in mind. Uh, in genius uh, zero, M03 is a point, M04 is a, is a, is a projective line, M05 is a uh, blow up of, P1, uh, of the, is, a, is a, a blow up, is the blow up, blow up of the product of uh, two projective lines uh, at three points. Uh, and in general, M0N is a smooth complex manifold. Um, yeah, and in genius, uh, and yeah, another simple example uh, is that in, Genius one, M11 one, one is the project, uh, the complex projective line with three orbifold points. And uh, we have uh, uh, natural cohomology classes on MGN. Uh, so if we, uh, so a point of the modular space of curves is uh, the isomorphism class of, uh, of a marked curve. And then we can consider uh, if we have a, so here we have a curve. C, and then uh, we can consider uh, a point, the ith mark point on it, and uh, assign to it the, uh, the tangent tangent space. Uh, yeah, and it is a uh, uh, yeah, there is tradition to uh, consider uh, the duo to it. Um, yeah, and then we see that over each point of the modular space, we have a, a complex uh, complex line, uh, uh, and then they all glue together in a complex line bundle over the modular space of curves, which is often called uh, the tautological line bundles and the uh, first churn class of it. Uh, the first churn class is um, uh, uh, called the Psi class and denoted by Psi I. So this is the um, an, an, an element in the second cohomology group of MGN with Q coefficients. So when I when I say homology groups, I mean Q coefficients. Um, okay. So and then uh, I will, uh, would like to present uh, Witten's conjecture precisely. Uh, so yeah, intersection numbers are 
uh, intersection numbers on the model on the model space of curves are the integrals uh, over the model space of monomials in psi classes. So if yeah, of course, if the sum, if uh, the degree of this class equals the dimension, then uh, the intersection number is uh, defined as the integral. And if the degree is not the dimension, then uh, the intersection number is defined to be zero. Uh, and then um, uh, standardly in uh, combinatorics, so we introduce the generating function of these intersection numbers. So we consider formal variables t0, t1, uh, et cetera, epsilon. And consider the generating series of intersection numbers. So this is the generating series, uh, which is often called the potential. And the exponent of it is usually called the partition function. Um, OK, so yeah, we get some uh, uh, huge series in infinite number of variables. Uh, and then uh, just to. Uh, just to uh, show uh, that uh, really it contains the all, in, all, all the information about the intersection numbers. Yeah, I just uh, write that the intersection number is the, uh, can be obtained for, for it by the following procedure. So we take the uh, derivative, the nth derivative, put all the variables to be zero, and then take the coefficient of epsilon to the power 2g, and then we get the intersection number. Um, Yes, and then uh, Witten's conjecture, which was uh, first proved by Kansevich, um, says the following. Uh, it says that the second derivative of the generating function f uh, satisfies the Cartier de Vries hierarchy, KDV hierarchy. If we identify also the standard in, the, in this uh, theory that T0 is identified with the spatial variable uh, of the uh, of, of a hierarchy. Yeah, so here I present the first two equations of the KDV hierarchy. This is an infinite, uh, it has infinite number of uh, uh, equations. Uh, yes, yeah, and it is a, yeah, first of all, it's a very beautiful conjecture, of course. Uh, uh, yeah, nobody could expect that intersection theory is related to an integrable system. Um, uh, but also, it is very useful uh, because it allows uh, really to compute all these integrals, all these intersection numbers. Yeah, because, because before Witten, people did not know how to compute these numbers. And then, yeah, he proposed this conjecture, Kansevich proved it, and then yeah, we now know how to compute all of them. Um, yeah, also in you know, order to compute them, one has to add one small uh, information. This is the string equation, uh, which is actually uh, which is easy to prove and it was yeah, immediately proved by Witten. So the string equation is easy, but yeah, the, his uh, conjecture about the KDV hierarchy is, yes, is highly non-trivial. Uh, Okay, so Witten's conjecture determines all the these intersection numbers, but also, uh, moreover, it, it uh, allows to compute much more. It allows to compute all integrals uh, over MGN of cohomology of natural of certain natural cohomology classes on MGN. Uh, yeah, MGN has a large, a very large cohomology uh, group, but there's a smaller subgroup, uh, which is called the tautological group, which is uh, very important for many applications. Yes, and um, and then, yeah, Witten's conjecture actually allows to compute all these integrals. Uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, yeah, yeah uh, this is why, uh, as, as it was already mentioned by Alexander Givental um, in his talk, uh, that uh, uh, KDV hierarchy uh, controls the cohomological intersection theory of MGN. Yeah, it can be said like that. <clears throat> Uh, okay, and then uh, I would like to, I will need it in uh, later, I would like to recall the uh, standard lux representation of the KDV hierarchy. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I, I think I don't have to recall this uh, technique of several differential operators uh, in this audience. So we consider this lux operator and uh, consider the following system of lux equations. Um, 
Yeah, so this is the last description of the KDV hierarchy. Um, yeah, the first I wrote already the first two equations be before. Uh, and then, <clears throat> yeah, uh, uh, in general, the equation looks like that. So it's uh, the it's uh, W times I plus one, the X, uh, the derivative by X over I plus one factorial plus some uh, plus some terms uh, containing epsilon. Um, yeah, so, okay. Yeah, yeah, so this was uh, very, very classical. Um, yeah, and then uh, I will move to a uh, more new, uh, to, uh, to a new stuff. So, uh, so I would like to move towards a non-community generaliza generalization. So, and for that, I would like to introduce the double ramification cycle. Um, <clears throat> yeah, here, before uh, presenting the uh, main, uh, the definition, I would like to present the idea uh, to the actually the first uh, naive version of it. Um, uh, so if we consider integers a1 a n with uh, with the vanishing sum, and then we can uh, make the following construction. So yeah, we can consider uh, the set of consider first of all the modular space of smooth smooth curves, and uh, consider the set of marked curves such that uh, this divisor a1 x1 plus etc a n x n is a principal divisor is a divisor of some um, meromorphic function is uh, the divisor of some meromorphic function so this gives a condition for a marked curve and this defines some algebraic uh, sub uh, space in mgn which and we can take its closure and take the point correct dual to it and then we obtain some cohomology class in mgn bar uh, yeah, this is the idea. This, yeah, yeah. In principle, it's a well-defined class, but it's not actually good uh, for applications. Uh, yeah, yeah. One of the reasons, for example, is that uh, the dimension of this class is not fixed. Actually, for example, if all AIs is equal to zero, then actually uh, this, uh, uh, yeah, this cycle. Uh, corresponds to the model aspects of curves. So actually, it will be in H0 for, formally from this definition. But if not all AIs are uh, equal, if not all AIs are equal to zero, then actually this class will be in H to G. Uh, and also, uh, it, it has it doesn't have a good uh, dependence on A's. Uh, so this cl class, although it is well defined and also actually uh, studied in the literature. Um, it's actually called the double ramification cycle constructed using the space of admissible covers, whatever it means. But okay, uh, we want another definition which has much, much, much better uh, properties. So uh, the correct definition uses, uses the modular space of stable relative maps to CP1. Um, uh, just to control the time, how much, uh, how much time do I have? 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. 20 minutes, okay, very good, thank you. So. Uh, yeah, the modular space of stable uh, relative maps to CP1 is introduced in the following way. So we, yeah, we consider this n tuple of numbers and uh, take positive, positive uh, numbers out of it uh, and form, okay, order them uh, in the, in the, uh, in the uh, non-increasing uh, uh, order. Uh, and then uh, get the partition. So, and then we can take uh, the negative parts and uh, so the negatives of the negative parts of A uh, and uh, obtain another partition. Uh, and then also um, consider the number of zeros among the AIs. So, and then <clears throat> there's a standard uh, modular space in gromov Witten theory denoted by uh, like this. So it's the modular space of stable relative maps uh, to CP1, to rubber CP1. Uh, also, all, uh, it's called the modular space of stable maps to rubber stable relative maps to CP1, but actually the target is not CP1. Uh, it's a chain of CP1s. Uh, so, yeah, so here I can see, uh, yeah, I, I draw a picture trying to illustrate um, what objects we consider. So we consider um, 
uh, maps from C to T, where C yeah, is as usual. Uh, C is a, is a, is a connected algebraic curve, uh, which is mapped to T to T, which is uh, a chain of uh, CP ones uh, with two points. Um, uh, zero, which we denote by zero and uh, infinity on the extreme components. Yes, and then <clears throat> there are various conditions for this map. So it should be ramified over zero with uh, the multiplicities um, corresponding uh, to the parts of mu. So here, and it is ramified over infinity. And also, actually, it is ramified over each uh, these, so we, we have these nodal points in the target, and actually our map map is ramified over them as well. So here at this nodal point, we have two branches, uh, two branches, and uh, yeah, they are ramified. So one branch is ramified over the left component, and uh, the right branch, branch, the right branch is ramified over the right. Uh, right oh, over the right component, and then we have the kissing condition saying that the two multiplicities should coincide. Um, yeah, so we have this object, and uh, we also have marked points uh, uh, that correspond to uh, AI, which are equal to zero. So we have this object. Uh, indeed, occurs that uh, such the isomorphism classes of such uh, maps form a good moduli space. And by the way, uh, so I said rubber, and uh, rubber, the word rubber is uh, represented by this tilde. Yeah, and then actually it um, uh, corresponds to the fact uh, that when we say it corresponds to, to this isomorphism B. So because when we um, consider isomorphism of two stable maps, we can um, say that the target is fixed or it's not fixed. So if uh, we can uh, allow automorphism of the target, or we we can um, uh, or, we, or, or we can do the opposite. So in this modular space, we allow the automorphism of the target. Uh, so we allow that. Uh, yeah. So here in this picture, yeah, I uh, I describe what I mean by isomorphism of two. Uh, stable relative maps. OK, so these, um, yeah, I hope you get an idea of what we consider. So then we can see uh, um, uh, there is uh, uh, the forgetful map from this modular space to MGN bar. So we can, so MGN, uh, this modular space is stable relative maps. It consists of isomorphism classes of maps. And then we can uh, forget the map and the target and then we are left just with, uh, with the curve. And so uh, this defines a map to MGN bar. And then <clears throat> here is the uh, correct uh, version of the uh, double unification cycle. So we consider the modular space of um, stable relative maps. And it is endowed with the virtual fundamental cycle, uh, a standard thinking. Uh, Gromwitten theory. So it's a virtual fundamental uh, class, it's a homology class uh, in this modular space. Then we consider the push forward under this map ST. Um, uh, the push forward to uh, MGM, we get a homology class, and then uh, we take the Poincare dual. And we get um, um, a simple computation shows that we get a class uh, in H2G of MGN. And this is a, a good, yeah, so this is the, the definition of the double application cycles with which we, we will work. Uh, so here I just list so a couple of properties. So for example, in uh, genius zero, it is very simple um, and in, um, and uh, the double application cycle is very simple. And uh, in um, and in general, it, it has a polynomial dependence on A's. So, uh, so it's a polynomial, not homogeneous, not homogeneous of degree 2G 
uh, with a coefficient in H2G. So it's uh, the work of Jan de Pathripan, Pixon, Zvonkin. Uh, and also it, it appears in symplectic field theory, surprisingly useful in the study of uh, the chromology groups of the modular space of curves. Uh, and um, as was already mentioned, can be used to construct integrable systems associated to chromological field theories. Okay, <clears throat> and then uh, we now uh, uh, we now uh, want to consider the intersection numbers of double rotation cycles with psi classes. So, um, so before we consider just the integrals of monomials in psi classes over the modular space of curves, and now we insert the double rotation cycles. Yes, and then we would like to consider the GH in series. And it occurs that it is controlled by a non-commutative KDV hierarchy. Uh, which now I want to introduce. Yeah, so a non commutative KD hierarchy. Yeah, it occurs so, yeah, very briefly. It occurs that the classical construction of the KD hierarchy, hierarchy through a lux operator works perfectly well if the variables uh, W and the dependent variable w and its derivatives do not commute. Uh, so actually, there is a family of uh, yeah, non-commutative KDV hierarchies corresponding to um, various product rules, um, non-commutative non product rules that we can have here. Uh, and a concrete version that we um, we need here is the following. Yeah, strangely, it also appears in physics, in physical literature. This version also appears in physical uh, literature. So a concrete version is the following. So consider uh, if we have two functions on uh, R2, then there is a standard uh, product uh, uh, product structure. Uh, called Moyal star, Moyal product or Moyal star product. Uh, yeah, it's defined like this. So this is an explicit formula. Uh, yeah, when I here actually, uh, actually this notation I learned, learned from Paolo, dx with the arrow means that dx applied to the left uh, part and the yeah, right arrow means that it, apply, it, apply, it, it is applied to the right part. Uh, but yeah, but formally, yeah, the definition is like that. Um, yeah, this is a standard actually uh, formula. Uh, why it is interesting, why it appears, uh, uh, one of the reasons uh, that, one of the reasons uh, uh, is that um, it, it is um, uh, the associative uh, it is the associative uh, uh, product, uh, which is a, uh, a quantization of the standard Poisson structure on R2. So on R2 we have a standard Poisson structure and this gives an explicit uh, quantization of it. This is one of the most important roles of this product. Uh, and then we can use this product to define a non-commutative KDV hierarchy. So, and, so we just, uh, uh, so we just say now that u, u is a function of x and y. And then we consider pseudo differential operators whose coefficients are uh, functions in x and y with this product, myal product, with this myal product. And then actually, I mean, the standard construction uh, through a lux operator works. So just we, sh we should just be careful uh, with the product. So, and remember that uh, ux and u do not commute. So that u uh, star ux and ux star u are, are different. Yeah, so, but everything works. So, uh, for example, yeah, the first two equations of the non-commutative KDV hierarchy uh, are the following. Uh, so, um, yeah, the first, so I write the first one and the second one. Uh, yeah, in the second one, uh, 
I, I, actually, I write the second one uh, in particular because I, because I wanted to show non-commutity, non-commutativity that uh, in the second term we should uh, yeah, uh, really uh, we should really have uh, u and uh, its derivatives in different orders. Uh, yeah, so uh, and uh, we get uh, strictly speaking, we get some system of evolutionary PDEs with two spatial variables. Yes, and then we we would like in general uh, the equation of the uh, non-commutative KTV hierarchy is dx yeah, of this term plus a correction containing epsilon and uh, yeah terms like that. And then we want to call the dispersion as KDV hierarchy, yeah, th this hierarchy. Okay. And actually the dispersion as hierarchy appears as um, the hierarchy controlling the intersection theory with the double notification cycle. Uh, yeah, the, the, the conjecture is, so this is the conjecture. The conjecture is the following. So yeah, maybe I just recall that FDR is just uh, yeah, the generating series of the integrals with the double application cycles. Yeah, and then we, we make uh, the following formal uh, transformations. So we consider uh, the following yeah, generating uh, the following derivatives. Um, yeah, and then, so we should have the second variable. So we add the second variable in this way. So here, uh, here you see that we, the second variable or the second spatial variable appears in this step. Okay, and then we make some uh, yeah, formal transformations. Um, yeah, okay, this one can look uh, uh, yeah, probably it's not immediately, immediately clear what it means, but um, I, I believe me that it's actually uh, a simple transformation. Uh, okay, and doing yeah this uh, yeah transformation, we obtain some function u that depends on uh, formal, at least formally on t's, uh, uh, yeah, epsilon and and uh, y. Yeah, and then our conjecture that, uh, okay, if uh, that uh, this uh, function satisfies the dispersionless non-commutative KDV hierarchy. Uh, with where we, uh, this, the second, this first special variable x is identified with t0, 0. zero. And uh, star is the Moyal product. So um, <clears throat> yeah, so this uh, shows how this already gives a uh, yeah, surprising appearance of non-commutative integrable system and non-trivial non-commutative integrable systems in the geometry of the modular space of curves. Uh, but I would like to now show how to observe the full non-commutative KDV hierarchy. Uh, but before that, uh, I would like to check one more time uh, how much uh, time I have. Uh, five minutes. Oh, okay. Okay. Good. Okay. So, um, so now, yeah, how to observe the full non-commutative KDV hierarchy in the geometry of MGN? Uh, and for this, we need a certain extension of the double vacation cycle, uh, which was proposed in this uh, work of Yanda. Harry Panda Pixton Zwonke. Um, okay, first of all, they uh, yeah, found a yeah, remarkable for explicit formula for the double application cycle. Uh, yeah, and I don't have much time. So uh, yeah, I present, yeah, this is the formula. Uh, yeah, this is <clears throat> yeah, a standard pictorial way to represent cohomology classes uh, using decorated stable graphs. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, if we have several moduli spaces, then we can, um, so for example, if, yeah, if we have two, uh, not, um, uh, two curves, then we can glue them, uh, we can choose a couple of mark points on them, uh, and then glue these mark points and get a nodal curve, and this defines a map from the product uh, of two moduli spaces to another moduli space. And we can iterate actually this uh, process, and uh, and uh, and use it uh, in order to assign to some graph like that a map from a product of modular spaces to some bigger modular space. So each vertex represents 
a modular space. Each vertex represents a modular space of genius that is written inside this vertex. Uh, by the way, the number of markings uh, corresponds to the number of edges incident to this vertex. And then, yeah, the, all this graph represents some product of modular spaces together with uh, the map, with a map to, the, to a bigger modular space. Okay, and then we have uh, some legs that uh, represent uh, marked points. And then each, we actually view each edge as a, uh, as, a, uh, um, as a pair of half edges. Okay, and then there is, a, okay, uh, okay, there is a very explicit formula, remarkably explicit. So to each marked point, we can assign exponent of this uh, psi class. And then to each edge, we can assign also some combination of psi classes. And then uh, there is some combinatorial, uh, some combinatorial data. We, we should also sum overall some weight or some weightings. Uh, okay, so I don't have time to say more details. So a really remarkable combinatorial formula. Uh, yeah, I must say, of course, I must say that it was first uh, appeared uh, in some drafts uh, of Pixton, but they do not uh, appear as uh, uh, papers even an archive, uh, and yeah, uh, this result appeared um, as a preprint in the, uh, in the paper of Yanda Pantlipanda Pixna Zvonki. Okay, so, and then, so, uh, yeah, this class depends on R, and then another combinatorial result is that it has a polynomial dependence in R for all sufficiently large R. And then we can take the coefficient of r to the power zero in this polynomial and get some class pg. Okay, it's some non-homogeneous class uh, and we decompose it in homogeneous components, um, pgd. Okay, and then a series of results. Uh, yeah, the first, uh, is, uh, the first result is that uh, in degrees higher than 2G, this class vanishes. So this, this is a result of Clader Yanda. And then uh, Yanda Panthiripan the Pixnas one can prove that in degree G we get the double revocation cycle. Uh, and they also remark that for D less than G, the classes do not yet have a geometric interpretation. Uh, and our next conjecture. Uh, our conjecture with Paolo uh, shows that, at least from the point of view of math uh, mathematical physics, these classes have a, a very elegant intersection uh, theory from psi classes. Yeah, and, yeah, and we do the same. So actually, we do the same as with double replication cycles. We just replace uh, double replication cycle um, with, uh, so we, we just add. Uh, um, before we just had a double vacation cycle and we and then we just add p uh, dg with d less than, smaller than g and add a separate variable in the generating function that controls uh, that so we get this uh, generating series of the intersection numbers with all these classes e uh, and then we get actually the same uh, we uh, we define the uh, uh, same transformations and uh, yeah, remarkably, uh, this function satisfies the full non-commutative KDE hierarchy. Uh, okay, so um, yeah, this gives at least uh, yeah the, the first interpretation of these classes, PGD for, for smaller d, and also it gives a remarkable appearance of integrable systems. Uh, in the study of the intersection theory of the modular space of curves. So my time is over. Yeah, I just uh, maybe spent uh, yeah, half a minute uh, to say that it, this conjecture doesn't appear, uh, didn't appear from uh, from nothing. Uh, so the so here I just uh, on the last slide I schematically presented uh, the logic. So to any partial cohomological field theory, we can assign double application hierarchy. Uh, yeah, this was already mentioned uh, before. And then to each double verification cycle, we can double verification hierarchy, we can assign the tau function. Uh, actually, this is the place where uh, Boris Antolis joined us and actually uh, 
explained us all the subtle details uh, regarding uh, tau functions. And so we, um, and yeah, we together <coughs> constructed tau function for the amplification hierarchy. And we also presented a very explicit conjecture uh, relating this tau function to the partition function of the cohomological field theory. And then uh, our, now our current work with Paolo came from the application of this scheme to, uh, to, to the cohomological field theory formed by these classes. So these classes P, form a partial cohomological field theories. And then together with Paolo uh, in our early paper, we computed the double replication cycle, a double replication hierarchy. And it is a non-commutative KDV hierarchy. So this is not conjecture, this is the result from our early paper. And then we applied actually uh, this conjecture to, to this situation. And then, uh, and this gives our current conjecture. So our previous computation of the double application cycle for this partial homological field theory together with our conjecture with Boris Antolich, Jeremy and Paolo, yeah, gives our current conjecture. Yeah, this is our evidence. Okay, so my time is over. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, so thank you very much, Alexander, for the excellent presentation and accessible. So let me ask uh, the audience if uh, any questions or comments? May I ask a question? Yeah. So, uh, how this uh, this your conjecture about uh, this uh, this what you told related to the previous one when you were coupling with this Hodge class lambda lambda of s? Uh, uh, with the Hodge class, uh, what do you mean? Because I mean Hodge class. No, no you be... you had this. Uh, uh, work with, I think, first your work and then with, with Paul, when we were just taking this as a cohomological field theory, we were taking just lambda of S, kind of like the sum of uh, the Hodge classes and and, and uh, integrating uh, uh, this double ramification cycle against this lambda of S class. Ah, maybe you mean uh, the quantization of the double ramification hierarchy uh, when we... Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, no, uh, yeah, so yeah, it's very interesting, uh, but uh, we do not have a, a relation. So so indeed, yeah, this uh, double ramification hierarchy uh, yeah, has a various algebraic structure. So it's always has quantization, uh, which you mentioned, obtained by, yeah. Uh, adding a combination of uh, Hodge classes. But, but, but there, there you also get, a, uh, by doing this, you, you also get a quantization of KDV, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, using this quantum K, uh, DR hierarchy, we get a quantization of KDV. And, uh, and this is a different one or what? Uh, but uh, completely different from this non-commutative. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think uh, that a relation between them is known. Mm -hmm. in, in particular, uh, Yasha, one is the quantization uh, uh, of the Poisson structure that you have on the phase space where the hierarchy is defined. So it's really a quantization of the Hamiltonian system, which is KDV. And this is the original, the one that you knew already. This one is a, a quantization of the space where the KDV fields live. It's a finite dimensional quantization just in two, in two dimensions. It's not this infinite dimensional phase space. Of course, what you could do is putting the lambda class into this example and try to quantize this one. So you would have a double quantization in some sense, but this is, this is still a classical system. So. You can still quantize it, but this we don't know yet. So it's, it's actually yeah, but the main obstacle is that uh, if you want to quantize, we should have a real cohomological field theory. Yeah, but this... Yes, but in this case, uh, you you could consider like the um, the regularization that is given by the the Pixton class with the finite r before uh -huh. taking the limit r to zero, quantize that, and then take the limit uh, afterwards. Yeah, yeah. So in that case, I think that something could be done. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So some further questions or comments? Uh, may I ask a simple question? Sure. Uh, well, as I know, all this um, non-commutative uh, KDV hierarchy and another hierarchy was kind of classified, but they all live and well-defined on free algebras. 
And I heard, I'm not expert, but I heard that the Moyle product, uh, uh, so the algebra uh, equipped with the Moyle product is not free. Is it correct? Uh, yeah, actually, I, I have a feeling that it is free, actually. Um, so, but uh, well, I heard it I, is not free. I, I spoke to several people. Well, ah, really? I, I don't know, you know, I'm not expert in that. And if it is not free, that should be an ideal in free algebra, uh, you know, factor of which you will get your moral product. Right? Yeah. And uh, then you have to check that this ideal is invariant with respect to your flows. Otherwise, this is the construction is inconsistent. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, yeah. Uh, thank you for your for your, your remark. Yeah, if if the Moyal, uh, yeah, if the algebra is not generated uh, uh, by Moyal product is not free. Uh, yeah, I think it it can have probably some geometric uh, interpretation, uh, probably predict some relations between cohomology classes. But um, in any case, it doesn't give any contradiction because you, you see, okay, uh, we have some functions of uh, t's, uh, x and y. Uh, so, and we uh, define some product uh, between them. And uh, so this is a correct product. So, and then we define this hierarchy. I mean, uh, one can check the compatibility of the flows. So, I mean, one, one doesn't get any contradiction even if the Moyal product is not, if the, uh, yeah, algebra generated by the Moyal product is not a free algebra. Yeah, that, that could happen if, if, if the ideal is invariant. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Okay. So, some further questions or comments? I have a question. Yes, please. So, what is special about KDV? Uh, could you do, I don't know, RKDV or KP? And what you have a feeling what the geometry would be? Uh, yeah, um, yeah. We thought, of course, yeah, about generalizations, but uh, but uh, yeah. Unfortunately, uh, yeah. Actually, I believe that there should be something. I really hope for that. Uh, but the computations became. Uh, I mean much more complicated immediately because uh, because of the because of just degree reasons so uh, here I mean as I said everything started from the double verification hierarchy and uh, okay anytime when we consider double verification hierarchy we start from uh, degree computations so we just uh, uh, try to see uh, what restrictions for the equations uh, for the actually for the first non-trivial equation, the degree reasons give. And uh, in this situation, the degree re reasons immediately uh, give uh, uh, very tight restrictions on the first non-trivial equation. So, okay, it's, it's still, we have to compute some coefficients, but not so many. <laughs> I mean, it's under control. But if we consider uh, any, <laughs> any cohomological field, field theory other than uh, KDV, then uh, the degree reasons that does not uh, give uh, in, doesn't give good restrictions. So uh, I mean, even the non the simplest non-trivial equation, uh, we don't uh, even we don't have any control, very little control on the first even on the first non-trivial the simplest first non-trivial equation. So. Uh, yeah, so we don't know. Uh, yeah, we do not know <laughs> uh, what to do. So you mean it's hard to guess? Yeah, it's very okay. it's hard to guess. Yeah, probably. Yeah, when we consider this situation, so we uh, yeah immediately. I mean, the first equation is under control, and we could uh, immediately do the computations in all genera. Uh, but here, I think one should to really start to do even in genius one, the computations become hard. So one really should start with. Uh, uh, yeah, computation is even genius one and try to guess something. So this looks much more complicated. Thank you. Okay, so since uh, we are running out of time, I wish to, to thank uh, Alexander Buriak for his excellent presentation. And I want to congratulate him for the awarding of the Browning Medal. And if you have it with you, <laughs> Maybe you can uh, show it to us. Uh, sorry, sorry, I, I, I keep it at home. 
<laughs> okay. No, and uh, now with my work. Uh, okay, so it wasn't stopped at the customs. <laughs> <laughs> it, did not, it was not blocked at the customs. No, not blocked. Not. It was released. Everything's fine. Okay, so let me congratulate uh, with Alexander in yeah. the name of everybody. Thank and you very much. I want uh, to conclude this session with a few words from the director of the mathematics area, Professor Gianluigi Rostra. Thanks, Professor Grava, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am very proud to be the coordinator of such a mathematics area, and uh, it's a great honor for me to be here today. And I would like uh, to thanks to all the organizers and above all to congratulate with the medalist. Uh, we know that we are in difficult times and we are a bit uh, tired and exhausted by the situation uh, which caused the delays and postposition of uh, also events. And there are lots of uncertainties. But the, the good thing is that uh, we are here on the giant's shoulders and uh, Professor Dubrovin has been one of these kind and gentle giants for us at CISA. Today, we are uh, looking at future. We are uh, looking at talents. We are looking at the future generation. And we are also celebrating exceptionally promising young scientists outsta with outstanding contribution in mathematical physics and in geometry. And so, my personal and also on behalf of all the mathematics area, warmest congratulations to Professor Gaetan Borot and Professor Alexander Buria for uh, this important achievement and also for uh, their outstanding uh, results and also the talks that uh, you have just delivered. The CISA mathematics area is an example of a community able to foster established research fields and at the same time, uh, develop a new initiative to foster innovation. And uh, this uh, spirit, able to combine uh, more classical and historical research fields with emerging ones, is given to the mathematics area of CISA a very special appealing and flavor. And uh, I would like also to say that we are not only a community, but uh, we are also a family. And the establishment of uh, CISA Mathematics Medals, and in this case, uh, Boris Dubrovin Medals, wants to celebrate the memory and the achievements of our giants with a deep gratitude to them, to consolidate their memories in the community, and uh, to allow also younger generation to know the history of uh, our institution made up by great visionary scientists. So my warmest congratulations to the medalist, but also I had to thank the selection committee, Professor Dario Bambusi, University of Milano, nominated by INDAM National Group in Mathematical Physics. My colleague, Professor Marco Bertola, SISA and Concordia University. Professor Marta Mazzocco, University of Birmingham, nominated by SISA. Professor Simon Salomon, at the King's College, London, nominated by INDAM National Group of uh, Geometric and Algebraic Structures and Application. And last but not least, Professor Viktor Vasiliev, President of the Moscow Mathematical Society. I would like to thank our sponsors and donors, Ernesto Illi Foundation, Trieste, and uh, CISA Media Lab, and of course, uh, INDAM National Institute for Advanced mathematics with the two national groups supporting this initiative, the one in mathematical physics and the one on geometry and algebraic structure and application. And of course, I would like also to acknowledge and to thank Moscow Mathematical Society. I would like to also, of course, congratulate with the organizers, the scientific organizers, the scientific committee of this uh, event. And I would like also to start advertising the new call for the next delivery of the Boris Dubrovin medals in 2022. So I would like uh, that you start spreading the info to talented scientists in the field, such that uh, as this year, we will have a very nice and outstanding competition. So thanks again for your attention, congratulations, and uh, I really hope to have everybody soon on campus to celebrate and to restart also our normal scientific activity without limitation and without social distancing.
Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Gianluigi. And uh, thank you for all the support. And I wish to conclude as uh, we have started. So um, projecting the, 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 the video of uh, Boris. Okay, so thank you very much. So I will I wish to congratulate again to Alexander Buriak and Gaetan Boro. And so the ceremony is over and we will resume probably in five minutes. We are